My name is Stephen Berkeley. I am the writer, director, producer of a movie called Life with Ghosts. It was Living with Ghosts, but I decided to change it because too many people thought it was about a haunted house. And in a way, it is about haunt hauntings, but a different kind of a haunting. It's more of a grief kind of a haunting. Um, yeah, there are people in the film who are having interactions with who they perceive, whom they perceive to be their late husbands. But it's really more about the feeling like you're you're in the doldrums of grief and just needing to climb out. That's really kind of the premise of the film. It's it's about three widows, and we kind of follow them in their journeys of trying to just get either get better or just see if they can make contact with their late husbands. And uh, the the widows in the story are all connected to each other, and so it's kind of an interesting. I would say, look at what happens to people in grief and how we all experience grief differently. Mm -hmm. uh, so the project got started because my dad died and my mother had a very, very, very tough time. My siblings and I all traveled down to Florida where they lived. And we did everything for my mother that we could do. We got her into a su support group and grief counseling and religious services and nothing made a dent in how she was feeling. But luckily, I'm sorry, Jan had heard this story a million times. I feel a little bit self-conscious talking about it again. Fine. You okay with me, Jan? L luckily, luckily, even though nothing was working and we were getting a little bit nervous because my, my siblings and I, we all had to return to our homes out of state and we couldn't leave our mother in this condition. And she didn't, she seemed to not be getting better. And we've all heard stories about people dying from broken hearts when they get to a mm. certain age. And we were worried that my mother was on that track. But fortunately, my mother has a sweet little old lady neighbor named Ethel who came over to the house and said, Irene, we don't talk about this a lot, but I do something to help me with my own loss. I write to my late husband every night. I write him a note and it makes me feel closer to him. I tell him all about my day. And then she leaned in real close to my mother and said, and he writes back. So my siblings and my mother, none of us knew what to do with this. We thought we, we assumed that, that Ethel was schizophrenic. Mm -hmm. That's how we kind of took it. But I was really curious about Ethel because she seemed very normal. She didn't seem like a schizophrenic. So I followed her over to her house where she showed me a stack of yellow legal pads with what she said was her conversations with her late husband over a 12 year period via automatic writing. I did not know what automatic writing was, but I was very interested. And so I, I just asked her a bunch of questions. I asked her if, if I could ask her late husband questions, Harold is his name. And so I interviewed Harold via automatic writing. And I was just thrilled meeting Ethel. I thought she she had something, and I kind of wanted my mother to have that too, because I it was working for Ethel. Whatever it was was working for her. So, I decided to get a camera crew down to Florida, and start filming my mother and her journey. By the way, my mother is Irene in the film, so I started filming my mother's journey, and I started filming Ethel's journey, and I thought if I could compare them, let it audience juxtapose them themselves and see, okay, which one has the right idea about how to go about this. And that's, that's how basically it was, it got started. Mm -hmm. And I was saying, um, before we started recording that the format of, of the movie is certainly very good because what it does is it, it, um, your co-producer and wife, Jen sent me through a, a link to view it, um, prior to the interview, of course. And it, it starts off very well where it, it displays the more skeptical side that most of the population has when you think of you know um after death communications you think grief induced bunk basically and it puts those views across and the views of psychologists with those views etc um to kind of draw in the, the majority of the audience and then it provides the actual evidence in support of of the reality of these things and very convincingly so um so I think that is a very, the format of, of the documentary was very well designed in that sense. Thank you, Darren. Yeah. So would you like to kind of talk a little bit about 
how that structure is in place? I mean, um, you did a great job just now uh, of doing that, that first of all, I had a great, great helper with the structure of the film. Uh, I borrowed somebody from Michael Moore's team. His name is Christopher Seward, who was responsible for Fahrenheit 9-11 and Sicko. So I had a great teammate in order to structure the film. I, I We both kind of thought that it was important to have the psychiatrist talk first because that was a more of a mainstream, he had a more of a mainstream perspective. It was a materialistic. And I wanted to make sure the audience knew that we were not necessarily on in Ethel's camp. We were we were objective filmmakers and we were just covering a story and starting out with the psychiatrist saying, oh, you know, this seems like something, you must be a very lonely old woman and this is why this is happening. It seemed important to have that front and center. And then, yes, I, I think slowly we kind of bring in other voices to make sure that everybody was heard. And yes, it was kind of a Trojan horse kind of a structure that we don't really introduce evidence of afterlife anything until until much later. Because I mm. wanted to I wanted the audience to come with us. And I knew we were going to lose half the audience right away indeed. if we started talking about heavenly mm. concepts at, at the opening. Yes, indeed. And I think the Trojan horse is when it's normally seen as kind of a negative thing, especially when you think of Trojans in terms of viruses and things. That's how it's seen in the modern day. But in this case, it's a very positive thing because, as you say, it, it opens up the evidence to more people. The more you bring in to watch at the beginning and to keep them watching, the more per people you're exposing to the real evidence of, of survival. Yes, which is why, Darren, I use the word ghosts in the title. A lot of people challenge that right away. Why are you calling? Why are you talking about ghosts? Spiritualists don't like that word so much. They much prefer a word like spirit because ghost has a spooky connotation. Mm. But that was very purposeful. And so I have to explain to people who challenge me that, hey, this is not a movie that's targeting the spiritualist camp. We want, we you should want, if you're a spiritualist, you should want a movie like this that targets the mainstream mm -hmm. because there aren't a lot of movies like this that target the mainstream. So I, I would think that more people would be on board once they understand the logic. Unfortunately, a lot of people still, I'm still getting a lot of heat from the title more than anything else about this film. People are unhappy with the title. Yeah. It's a shame because again, you know, it, it's easy to criticize when you don't understand the context of why decisions were made. And as you say, you know, ghosts generally spiritual from what I, from people I've spoken to spiritualism kind of believes that ghosts are not intelligent, but that they're kind of memories in energy that just repeat themselves. Um, so I can understand why they don't like that idea, but as you say, most people in, in the world like ghosts because it's entertaining and because it frightens them. So anything with ghosts in the title for people that like horror and things like that will flock in just to be entertained. But then, as you say, underneath, what you're actually doing is providing the evidence as to why spirits and communication and after-death experiences are genuine and indeed why one shouldn't fear death or necessarily very deeply grieve the loss of a loved one because they will see them again eventually. Yes. So. yes. As you say, the Trojan is, un is in the end offering an incredibly important message to as many people as, as you can possibly bring in with that title. Yes, exactly. Hey, are you curious? I bet you're curious, Darren, as to how I met Jan. Yes, absolutely. I was wondering. <laughs> I was gonna, That was going to be one of the lines of questions. Um, yeah, because I'd imagine it wasn't kind of a, 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 a um, coincidental meeting. Was it kind of before you had the idea for the for the movie or before or, or after oh the, the the movie was well in progress for years before i met jan i was really just want i wanted to make a movie that featured people going through grief so i already had my 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 characters which happened to happened to be my mother and her friend and her friend's daughter-in-law so i had my people but i had no ending now fortunately I was getting a lot of information, like I was doing a lot of research and I was able to find Al Botkin who had developed this technique that was very interesting. 
and I hadn't, and he did tell me that there was something going on at the University of North Texas where they were going to be like really taking a close look at this technique. Mm -hmm. But I didn't do anything about it until the daughter of one of the subjects of the film also read the research because I was providing all the people in the film the research I was finding. She read the research herself and she said, I want my mother to try this therapy. So I said, hey, I will arrange for this, but you know, I need to, you know, I need your promise that you're gonna let me film you to deliberating as to whether or not you should do this. I want your mother's reaction spontaneous. Don't tell her about it until I have a camera crew there. So I, I arranged for this to be a very um, I guess, get the emotion of the decision making behind mm -hmm. going. But that's when I call I, I got a hold of Jan through Alan Botkin. And I said, hi, my name's Steve. I'm, I want to, I, I love what you're doing. Will you allow me to be your documentarian? I want to document this study as part of my film. And that's how it all happened. That's how Jen, Jan and I became teammates in this project. Right, Jan? Right. That's perfect. <laughs> Fantastic. I, I've never had the chance to speak with Alan myself, but I have spoken to one of his, um, one of his students. I believe student is the right word, Graham Maxey who was in your film as well, I know. And that's kind of my introduction to IADC. And it's a fantastic, you know, fascinating um, process because it's the most successful, statistically, the most successful form of grief counselling there is. And it was something, I might be getting this wrong, but I'm sure Graham said it was something like a 90% a success rate in the first studies when someone wasn't aware what was what the idea was and, and it kind of went down to around 75% once people had the idea of what they were expecting. But even so, you know, as Jan will attest, I'm sure in psychological kind of studies and, and counseling processes, even a 75% success rate is phenomenally successful, you know, yeah, beyond anything else. Especially in the field of grief counseling, because about 10 years ago, there was a big splash in the field of grief counseling about uh, a... Um, meta-analysis, which is an analysis of all the published studies so far that showed that traditional grief counseling had no effect, no clinical effect. And um, after that, there was some re-examining of the statistical analysis and that sort of thing. And they found out that there was actually, you know, a small effect, but not anything earth-shaking at all. And, um, and interestingly, in our study, which consisted of two 90-minute counseling sessions one week apart. And uh, so uh, people who were grieving came to us. We divided them randomly into two groups. One group got traditional grief counseling, which is talk therapy with maybe an exercise or you know, things like that, and, um, and then induced after-death communication. Uh, so into these two groups. So the um, uh, what happened with the two the group that got the two traditional grief counseling um, experiences was that their grief you know we tested people everybody before the first session and after the second session and the people who got the traditional grief counseling had either no change or in some cases they got worse. And in the IADC sessions, they there were a few people who had no change, but everybody else got better and significantly better with what's referred to as a huge clinical effect. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, uh, and and that's not to completely trash traditional grief counseling because it might be that with more time people would show improvement. But then the other, on the other hand, if you can get significant relief in two sessions why do this other thing you know <laughs> yeah and the important i suppose the importance as well is that that effect is happening almost immediately but also that it is lasting for a lifetime you know um because traditional therapy if iadc had a short effect so, or had a, a short effect length you know it was fantastic for the first year or so but then the effect kind of waned off and you became grief field again versus say if a traditional therapy took longer but lasted a lot longer then of course that is i'd imagine is preferable 
But I mean, that's not the case, I don't believe, is it? Yeah. Well, actually, I can't speak to the lasting effects because we didn't actually assess that in our study. But we do have clinical evidence that uh, that the effects are lasting, you know, from clients Mm -hmm. who are uh, are still in touch with their therapist or they come back for a tune up or to address some other issue and and report that the the effect from IADC was lasting. And I suppose mm-hmm. it's it's really difficult to gauge that because it's still such a new therapy, I believe. Is it, when, when when was it started? Uh oh gosh, I think around in the in the 1990s is when Botkin uh stumbled onto this when he while mm-hmm. he was a um psychologist for the Veterans Administration in Chicago, <clears throat> working with uh veterans with PTSD, and he stumbled onto a veteran who during the process recall had a, an after death communication that was mm. profoundly healing for him. And that really got uh, Al's attention. Yeah. And that's how he, you know, veered mm-hmm. off into this whole area. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's been around for a while, but it actually would not be hard to assess because we could give the same grief instrument six months later and see whether the, the effects are lasting. Um, mm-hmm. We just didn't build that into our study. Yeah. And I mean, you know, the effects of ADC uh, or IADC and the efficacy of it would make sense to me theoretically, because, you know, it, people uh, have said in the in the academic circles of, of psychology that, you know, grief is a very complex thing. And it is in the sense that people experience it differently. But from where I sit as and I'm, I'm not a counselor, but from where I sit, the, the main thing of grief is is losing someone and, and believing you'll never see them again. And traditional therapy kind of deals with that as an underlying, well, that's true. Let's deal with how to cope with that reality. Whereas IADC in a lot of cases proves personally to the individual that they will see them again and that they are still there. And to me, because that fear and that sadness of losing someone forever is effectively wiped out, so too is is the origin of the grief. And although it's still difficult to not live with them here and now, the belief and the knowledge to a lot of people that they will see them again, and that's certain, just imagine for us, you know, what kind of relief that would be to know that deeply, mm-hmm. you know. Yes. And I think that is why IADC tackles grief directly and much more effectively. Mm-hmm. I do want to speak to that, Jen. And now I want Jen to be able to chime in because I'm not an IADC therapist and Jen is. But I think it's important to add, and please corroborate this if you can, Jan, that the philosophy that Al Botkin, the founder, tries to impart onto all the therapists is that it's not the place of the IADC therapist to impose their belief system onto the client. So it's never said during the therapy, oh, you're going to get to meet your loved one again. It's not, it's, it's not a reunion. Mm-hmm. It's... The idea of the therapist, I mean, the idea of the um, the treatment is to est- reestablish a relationship, but it's up to the client as to what's actually happening. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, um, it's it's just a general thing in in psychotherapy in general that we can't promise any specific thing to happen or any specific outcome. Uh, so what we say to clients is that. Um, the the therapy is designed to help you get into a state of mind where if there's going to be communication it can happen more easily but uh but we find that about um three quarters of people have some kind of experience about a quarter don't and we don't exactly know why that is um but uh so so you know there's the possibility but not the guarantee that you'll have that experience. And the the therapy actually has two aspects to it. One is the the ADC part, but before that is um, work around a question of asking the client, what is the most painful aspect of your grief? And then whatever they, uh, with the counselor, identify, because sometimes it isn't absolutely clear, but through a, a dialogue process, it becomes clear. Then we do some work around that most painful aspect. 
and when and the work usually reduces the pain substantially and when that pain is reduced that's when the person seems to um, be most likely to have an, an after-death communication experience, which I want to hasten to say can take any of a number of forms. Um, you know, we we often think about um, the way it's portrayed in uh, the media, you know, that I see the deceased person. Um, but actually, the um, uh, experience can take any form. Uh, it can be a something with no sensory content at all, just a, a definite sense of the presence of the person, the deceased person. Or it can be hearing something, seeing something, feeling something, smelling something, or even, even a sense of um, knowing that the, that the deceased person is present without any specific evidence to that effect. So, um, and, and that uh, people need to be, when they go into IADC uh, therapy, they need to be prepared, and we do prepare them, that to be open to receiving the message uh, from a deceased loved one in whatever form it comes, and not to have preconceived ideas about how it will come, but just be open and notice anything that's happening and report it because that might be the opening to um, a sense of, of genuine connection. Indeed. And I think a, a lot of people would immediately think, well, this is going to be a case of suggestion, as, as you say, which is why right. work such as um, hypnotherapy-induced communication, like that of Dr. Newton and, and people like that, it's difficult to take that as evidential because you don't know what kind of beliefs are being passed on, not deliberately, but you know, subconsciously. But um, I think the the fact that um, the effect size went from a 90% to a 75%, uh, 90% when people weren't aware of what the process was going to be and what the outcome was, versus 75% when it was more known about IADC and that it was an intention of, of communicating to some degree, that shows, in fact, the opposite effect, that suggestion seems to cause a lowering of efficacy as opposed to a, a or a, a lowering of a, of a possibility of having a communication That's whereas right, going in it yeah because expectation becomes actually a barrier uh and grasping are those those are all barriers uh what's what is facilitative is to be in an open inviting whatever you know however you might want to come kind of attitude and uh, and so uh, so any expectation or grasping actually gets in the way, mm. yeah. And you know that um, this whole question of uh, is is this real or is this some kind of um, delusion that the person has? You know that they're having communication uh, goes to uh, we have to move out of the domain of IADC into the domain of just the general research on. Uh, veridical perception during transpersonal experiences. And we know that there are like oh, hundreds of cases uh, where people during near-death experiences um, had, uh, th yeah, there's the book, The Self Does Not Die. Those cases are, are um, described in that book um, that they're verified paranormal phenomena verified by credible third parties, very carefully investigated each of these cases. And so, um, and and although there is not yet a companion book about veridical after-death communication, I am very aware of many cases. And uh, for example, um, one of my friends, Roberta Moore, is a videographer and she uh, recorded a man named John Wigglesworth who uh, his father died and uh, his father had told John a couple of years before that his father had purchased a small gun and, and was keeping it in the top shelf of his closet. And he didn't even tell his wife, but he had it there just for protection in case he ever thought he needed it. But he asked John that, you know, if ever 
anything happened to him, the father, that John would go and remove the gun from the house. So after his father died, he remembered this. And so he goes over to the house and uh, he was actually helping his mom clean things out. And so it was a perfect opportunity to get up to that top shelf and look around. And long story short, he could not find the gun anywhere. He's not there, nowhere in the house, the car, the safe deposit box. I mean, he looked everywhere, could not find this gun thought, well, maybe dad got rid of it and just forgot to tell me or didn't think to tell me or whatever. So a few days later, he's asleep and he has this experience. And I'm not going to call it a dream. He, he calls it a dream, but that's because um, that's the only word we have in English for experiences during sleep. But people who have these experiences while they're asleep almost always say that phenomenologically they're very different from dreams they're vivid they're not the crazy kind of thing they're usually pretty compact and the person remembers it vividly and the memory stays with them for decades and dreams just don't follow any of those you know features no. so anyway he has this experience while he's asleep that he's in his parents house and his he's walking down the stairs into the basement while his father is calling to him from above and he's saying, yeah, go down the stairs into my dark room. And so John is pr first protesting, you know, I've, I've uh, been in the basement, I've looked all around. And his father says, no, no, keep going into the into my dark room. And, and John says, I looked in the dark room. And his dad says, no, no, go across the room to this cabinet, and pull the cabinet away from the wall. And there you'll find the gun lodged between the cabinet and the wall. And John does this in the dream. And then he uh, wakes up and thinks, oh, that was weird. So over the next few days, he's kind of thinking, you know, eh, you know, dreams are fantasy, blah, blah, blah. But but it's bugging him. So mm. finally, he goes over to the house. He says, Mom, you mind if I go in the basement, look around? No, go ahead, honey. So he goes downstairs into the dark room to the cabinet, pulls it away from the wall. There is the gun. And so John says, in no way did his father ever tell him that he moved, that he moved it to any mm. place. And um, and so it's one of those things where, you know, how could John have known this unusual hiding place unless the experience he had in his sleep mm. was genuine? So that's yeah. just one case of veridical after death communication. Now, it once it's established that there are lots of cases like this. And I've heard many cases, people who found missing documents. One person, their father had taped their his uh, ins life insurance policy in his nightstand, opened the top drawer, and it was up underneath there, someplace where nobody ever looks. But his father, uh, her father appeared and told her, and she went to his um, nightstand and opened the drawer and felt up under there. And by golly, mm, there was mm. his life insurance policy taped up there. So once it's established that these that in the cases that have the potential to for the con something to be verified, because usually in ADC, the message is, hi, honey, I'm here. I'm fine. I love yeah. you. I'm still connected to you. And I'll see you later. And um, there's nothing veridical in that. But mm -hmm. in cases where there is veridical content where it can be uh, confirmed, um, that lends credibility then to the hi, how are you? And I'm fine and I love you and I'll see you later ones. Um, it it uh, makes them more believable that they really are something and not just like wishful thinking or, Indeed. you know, blah, blah, yeah. blah. Yeah. And I believe... Stephen, you you covered a lot of this phenomena in the in the film, or at least touched upon it. Yes, for sure. And I, I'm I'm curious, and <clears throat> given what Jan just said, and this is something I would I was trying to put in the movie, but I didn't I didn't really have a, I get the best opportunity to. But maybe maybe it can be in this in, in this interview. Are we at a place where we could say that? Mainstream science does accept that consciousness survives bodily death for at least a period of time. We're not we're not even close to that yet. No, I don't. And why, and why not? With all these veridical cases, why not? Oh uh, well, I you know th there have been two separate incidents where scientists have been dialoguing with their colleagues 
about this and bringing up all the evidence of veridical perception, you know, that, that casts light on the reality of these experiences. And in these two separate cases, their colleague finally said, even if it were true, I, I couldn't accept it because it would just mean changing so much of how I think. And so there's there's a there's a resistance to um, accepting something that is going to cause somebody to have to re-examine their worldview, mm -hmm. and it, it's kind of too bad because actually, uh, philosophical materialism, which is the belief that everything is a manifestation of the physical world, and so um, so there that there is no transmaterial reality um is uh is isn't actually negated per se it's just encompassed in a larger perspective that there are a lot of things that are very physically oriented and mm -hmm. you know like we've discovered antibiotics because of our understanding of how the physical world works and i'm very grateful for for antibiotics i probably wouldn't be alive today if it weren't for them and there's also something larger, but I think uh, people uh, uh, people who are tied to materialist philosophy uh, feel threatened that somehow this bigger picture is going to negate materialism, exactly. and it doesn't. Yeah. It that's, it only adds to it. That's something I've, I've often said. You know, it's a very big misunderstanding that it, it, accepting these phenomena to be true would mean everything we know about science is wrong. No, it doesn't. It means it's enhanced upon, mm -hmm. as you say. Um, but I, I also see a lot of hypocrisy in that kind of that kind of thinking that you were mentioning. You know, it means if even if this was true, it means I'm going to have to change my whole worldview, because the same people when they're talking about our beliefs will say, "Well, science doesn't care about your feelings or your beliefs. Facts don't care about your feelings." Well, here are the facts, and now you're saying the same thing. You know, it's it's very easy to be skeptical of an opposing view, but very very difficult to be opposing of one's own views in the light of new evidence. And it's much easier to believe that evidence must be explainable. It just can, it's going to take time to be so than to accept that there is something going on here that implies more about the universe of which we know maybe point one percent of. You know. Yeah, yeah, so true. And, and another way to say that is that. Uh, people who consider themselves scientists are actually not behaving according to the principles of science. The principles of science are to have a hypothesis and look at the evidence and decide if the hypothesis is, is supported or not. And um, there's lots of evidence that supports the survival, that, that consciousness is not uh, is not a product of the brain, but is um, pre-exists the, the formation of the brain, is closely associated with it during physical life, and then continues to exist after the brain, the demise of the brain. Mm. There's lots of evidence of that and, um, yeah. and you know, scientists. And, and, and yeah, the, the most opposing question I often hear back is then, well, if you think the consciousness exists without outside of the brain, then how can that be? You know, what is the medium by which consciousness exists? Prove it to me. And I'll say, well, what's the mechanism and the and the evidence that the brain produces it then? There's equal amounts, you know, zero. We've got correlation. We've got no causation. So mm. believing that the brain produces consciousness in a way we don't understand is to me equal to the idea that the brain mediates it and that consciousness exists somewhere else neither of which are our evidence, but for some reason, the production theory of the brain is, is the go-to. Yeah. And now, as you say, all these phenomena and all these evidences have now come up to challenge that. So in my opinion, the consciousness existing outside of the brain, fine, we don't know why or how or where, is more evidenced than the brain produces based on correlation alone. Yeah. Yeah. What's, what, what's your thoughts on that, Stephen? You know what? <laughs> I, I feel like such a layman. <laughs> um yes you know i don't I'm not, I'm not sure how to respond to that i feel like i don't have the uh i don't i don't have the um the credentials to speak to add to what jan was saying um mm. i would just i would just love for some time in during my lifetime i would love to hear that mainstream science accepts 
the reality, what I, I perceive as reality, that consciousness does survive bodily death, and it's just a given. We don't have to have this debate continually, because once we say, yes, it's true, consciousness does survive bodily death, then we get to move on to the next topic, which mm. is, okay, what are we going to do about this? How are we, are we going to live our lives differently? How are we going to Indeed. plan? So... And That's I think that for. that knowledge in and of itself, can you imagine how transformational that would be to the majority of the population? Because, and I, I don't understand why it's not seen above, you know, menial studies that you you think are, are just so far away from what is necessary. You know, I'm trying to think of an example, um, trying to discover a better form of paint that is waterproof, or, you know, just random studies that are going on to discover things. And yet, the study of what happens after death is neglected or discounted entirely when it is the most, probably the most important thing for humanity to understand and the most transformational to, mm. to understand, mm. you know, because then, as you say, you get into the questions of, well, what are those environments like then? If this is, if this right. does happen, what are those environments like? And then ultimately, what does that mean for the nature of reality right. itself? The major questions, you know, don't worry about what sort of paint we can develop, worry about, the ontology of the universe mm -hmm. yes and what yeah. i tried to do and i'm sure jan will not remember this but when i interviewed jan back in 2017 i i asked her this question three times the question was can we say that consciousness survives bodily death and jan wanted to get the wording just right because she didn't want to be criticized or anything like that so she answered she kept on answering the question but Unfortunately, because she's constrained by the world that we live in, I couldn't get that sound bite that I'm still looking for, Jan. You guys, you can see, <laughs> I'm still looking for that sound bite. But when you are ready to deliver that sound bite, promise me that you'll you'll give that to me on my film. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Well, I'm curious, Steve. Uh, were you? Did you hold your the views you hold now before you started the movie, or how did the making the movie affect your belief system? That's a great question, Jan. Thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was open. That's the most I could say about me because I was brought up materialist, and I was in a career. I mean, accounting. You know, I mean, that's a you know black and white profession, mm -hmm. right? So I wasn't really thinking outside that box. I would just open, and I remember watching John Edwards' show, Crossing Over, and I remember, okay, how is he doing that? Like, what is he, how is he figuring out what these people's lives were like before they entered the studio? And I was trying to figure out what he was doing. So, but I, I at some point I was like, he seems so earnest. John Edward the Medium, in case your listeners don't know, he seemed so earnest, I couldn't believe that somebody was acting who was doing that. So I started to open up. And then, so so just being open-minded in that way helped me like ask Ethel questions when she came over to the house and told, told my mother to try automatic writing. So I was learning throughout the course of the making of the film. And as you may have seen, remember from the film, it took seven years to make the film. And over that period of time, I slowly but surely completely crossed that bridge. And I became from someone who was on the fence about spiritualism to someone firmly planted on the spiritualist camp territory. Mm. And and yeah, so I, I, I'm wide open now. Yeah. Wow. That's cool. What a great mm. personal benefit from the all the, the public service that you're doing with the documentary. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Appreciate Absolutely. That. Mm -hmm. yeah mm. um trying to think of the next talking point if you want to i want to focus mainly on, on your film Stephen, of course, because it's a very important thing for people to, to my acknowledge. favorite topic darren yeah i'm sure <laughs> <laughs> jan knows how much i talk about my book so uh, I, I can i can <laughs> testify to that always your babies aren't they your own projects um so darren this became a movie to like my life's goal it, it, mm. it's, it's also that's that's relatively recent since the, since the film ended and i've been just trying to get it out there at first i was really just trying to sell a movie and now i'm realizing how important it is to first the people who are seeing it and want to see more and i am now kind of more I'm, i feel almost like an advocate now which i never mm. intended on being 
but mm-hmm. I feel like it's like my job to help get people to see this film. Of course, I wanted people to see the film anyway, but now I have different purposes. I feel I feel like I have serve. I feel like I'm serving a higher purpose, which is yeah. kind of nice. Absolutely, the priority shifts. I mean, a lot of people make movies, mainly entertainment movies, for you know personal financial gain, um, which is probably it's going to be a, an encouraging factor for you, of course. But it's That's, funny I how. I tell you a secret though, Darren. Documentarians are not in it for the money. Exactly. <laughs> Docu- yeah. They're exactly. Inf- infamous. Infamously, document, document, documentaries do not really make money. Sometimes, if you're lucky, you break even. So mm-hmm. this was never a, a financial endeavor. But yeah. of course, it, it's good to to have those um, to get some compensation back. Of course, of course. But a lot of people, when someone writes a book about near death experiences or makes a movie about near death experiences, immediately it adds skepticism because well, they're in it for the money. Doctor Eben Alexander faced a lot of that, as well as as well as others. Um, and you mentioned in your movie that, you know, you wanted to um, have the raw emotions of somebody who was looking to undergo I- IADC, but was skeptical about it. Um, many people, I'm sure that's good to know, because I'm sure many people would, would think these are kind of staged. I mean, although it might be real, the emotions, they're going to be staged to get the right takes and do them over and over again. So the fact that you mentioned that it was kind of cameras on now go and talk to your mother. And we'll get it the first time through. That's encouraging to show that, you know, although a lot of documentaries, and I, I say, especially those that I've seen produced in the US, have all the background music and the long wide shots and the, you know, the aggressive camera work to make it entertaining to keep people going. It, mm-hmm. They often come across as being, although they're documentaries, they're still obviously designed for entertainment. Um, and that often takes away some of the feelings for me anyway, of the genuineness of it. Yes. Um, so what, what are your thoughts on that within your documentary? I, I started getting questions like, were these reenactments? And yeah. that bothered me. Um, I wanted the movie to look pretty because this is my first fully independent feature film and I'm a movie buff. So I did, I had the inclination to want to make the movie look pretty, but to your point, Darren, if I had to do it all over again, I wouldn't try to make it look so pretty because you do lose a little bit. The rawness is what gives it authenticity, right? So I lost a little bit of that authenticity by making it look polished. And people, sometimes they leave, they, they, they finish the film and they're confused. Was this real? Was it re- re- reenacted? And that, that's why I had to, at some point, put like a text on screen in the very big opening of the movie where the credits are. This film follows his two follows two families. There's no reenactments. Nothing is scripted. And I had to do that only because people were getting confused. And you don't want people confused while they're watching the film because that mm-hmm. means they're not really watching the film anymore. They're just trying to figure figure it out. Indeed. Yes. And it was it was clear to me the section with the um the older Jewish lady was she a Jewish lady? That's my mother. Yes, Irene. that's your mother, Irene, and and she was very. You could tell, you know, even simple things like slightly stuttering over her words here and there. You could tell that it was genuine, um, and that you could tell that she was very reluctant to accept because, of course, you know, the Jewish scriptures are very generally, especially the Orthodox Jewish scriptures, are very watertight this is what's real this is not this is demonic so you could tell that she was genuinely reluctant to accept these things but after having her own experiences she was more open to it so clearly her experiences were powerful enough to at least make her question some of the orthodoxity of of the scripts i don't know how orthodox your mother is but i know generally a lot of jewish people are very adamant to the scriptures yeah i think with my mother's case she just wanted like confirmation from her rabbi that what she was doing was not dumb mm-hmm. uh she's I, I wouldn't say my mother followed scriptures like that she she liked to go to services you know on friday mm-hmm. nights or saturday mornings and just sit there and feel like maybe she's getting some god through osmosis yeah yeah <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah and hopefully you know as you say your um your documentary and your her exposure to that side kind of did help her with uh, with opening up to some of these realities. And, and I suppose it's difficult then to how do you marry that with my religion? You know what helped, Darren? I was making a movie 
and I needed my mother's help. I needed her to be in the movie and I needed her to try things. So my goading her to like try automatic writing, maybe Ethel's got something that she's doing that could work for you. I mean, just my being there with a camera crew and saying, mom, try this. That's what I think opened her up in a bigger way. My mother was also, I feel, I don't know if I should call it open or there's a, there's a fine line sometimes between being open and being gullible. Mm. I, mm. I can't, I, I don't know where my mother falls there, but I think that she's definitely an open spirit, a free spirit. Yeah. And I think she just needed some, some, uh, some persuasion to get her to try certain things. And once yeah. she tried it, she felt like, wow, I she really genuinely felt like that scene is a scene towards the end of the movie where Ethel is helping my mother automatic, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And my mother genuinely, I'm hoping you could feel that was a genuine smile. She had, she genuinely feel like she was in communication with my father. And yes, that yeah. was pretty powerful. I don't think my mother had ever experienced anything like that before. And that did change the tone of her mourning or grieving process in a big way. Yeah. And I think to supplement that authenticity was, I I'm trying to remember if it was your mother or another person who was genuinely getting annoyed that she couldn't do it and that it wasn't working. Um, because again, you know, too, yeah. that was your mother as well, because <laughs> yeah. you know, these things need to be developed. And I think, when, yeah. when you start doing it and it doesn't work, you do get frustrated because, well, am I not good enough to do this? Am I just not able to do this? Right. So I think add, adding that that frustration into the movie as well does enhance the genuineness of, of the... Um, how, how did Ethel react when she... I think, again, it was probably in the, around the middle or towards the end of the movie when she went to a psychologist who was trying to clearly diagnose her as opposed to accepting. How did Ethel react to that? You mean like like privately like how does she feel about the psychiatrist yeah. questioning her yeah because clearly the psycho the psychiatrist was very much there's something going wrong in her mind that she believes this whether it's grief or whether it's psychosis we just need to discover what it is where of course ethel is adamant that this is a genuine thing yeah how did she find being interviewed like that i'm i honestly i'm not sure i know that when i watch the film i feel that that psychiatrist was being relatively dismissive, borderline contemptuous. That's how I felt. I'm not sure if that was actually what he was feeling, but he seemed to be doing that to her. And I, I felt, I felt for her, and I felt like, I felt vicariously disrespected. So I was wondering how Ethel felt about it, but she did not let on that she took it personally at all. Mm. He, she, I got, I got the feeling from her and she didn't say this, but I got the feeling from her that he was just doing his job. Yeah. I asked him, I asked him to diagnose Ethel. I, I wanted him to do the, whatever he would do to come to someone who comes into his office and has this story about being in communication. I wanted him to do whatever he would do normally. So he gave a very thorough psychiatric examination by the book. So I can't begrudge him for that. The fact that he was being somewhat dismissive, that bothered me a little bit, but you know, he, he, I guess he, psychiatrists are entitled to be human. And yeah. I guess he couldn't hide his own disbelief to what Ethel was saying. Indeed. And um, I think the, pro the problem is, you know, as a psychiatrist, his professional life and his ac ed education, academic education would all have been saying to him you know and, and teaching him that everything can be diagnosed anything unusual is, right. is an issue of the mind and not anything else yes. so you can but, understand his his uh, yeah yes but uh, jan i want you to speak up next but i don't, I don't want to lose this thought somebody yeah. just told me recently in a q a that i was giving they want to know why dr the dr samuel in the film was being so the contemptuous of ethel because in therapy and I also, I think Jen will be able to corroborate this. You're you're trained to have positive regard, right? Is that right, Jen? Am I saying that right? Positive regard right. towards the client. I, what, they're, what they're saying. I didn't, I didn't, I wouldn't qualify what he was doing as positive regard. Yeah. You know, this is, of course, a big um, focus of the International Association for Near-Death Studies that I'm president of right now. We, we want to get the word out to medical professionals that actually the the response that he gave, although it's 
not unusual, is completely misinformed. Um, there, there is, uh, we know from research that there is no relationship between after death communication and psychopathology. Um, and that's because so many people experience after death communication. Uh, we know that there's no, uh, more specifically, there's been direct research about uh, the relationship between near death experiences and psychopathology, no relationship. And I've done studies, well, and, and in fact, our study at UNT, um, we did a psychological assessment of our, our clients, and there was no relationship. Well, first of all, our um, most of our clients didn't qualify for any kind of psychological diagnosis. They were just mentally healthy, and they were just as likely to have an ADC during the IADC part as the very few people who qualified for a, a psychological diagnosis. There's just no relationship between after death communication and psychopathology, mm. but mm. somehow the word hasn't gotten down to the front lines. You know, the the information is there for anybody who really wants to examine it. But um, it is it is a therapist's job to, at the same time of valuing the inherent um, worth of the of the person, to assess whether they're experiencing mental disorder. And so, but it can be hard to do that, uh, to do both, to continue to sh say you're, you're a, a, a worthwhile, valuable person who has schizophrenia, you know, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, but I think his, his contempt really was based on um, uh, misinformation, at lack of information. And that's that's one of our big goals at IANS is to get that information out to medical professionals, especially mental health professionals and uh, physical health professionals and chaplains, the kind of people who are most likely to hear about these kind of experiences. So we've done a lot of writing and research and all that on it. Mm. And I think you can push that point further to those who publicly denounce any kind of spiritual phenomena like yeah. the the Richard Dawkins is like the James Randies like the Stephen Novellas and and the, maybe the Neil deGrasse Tyson to some degree because again you can't blame them because a it's their professional heritage at stake here to be skeptical but also when you hear them talk on these subjects they're saying what they believe and they're genuine about it but it comes from a lack of putting the time in to understand it, which is why I prefer to go to the Bruce Graysons, who, yes, are, are you know, pro-survival, but they're pro-survival for the right reasons, because they've put years and years into studying the phenomena exclusively, whereas the Richard Dawkinses and the Neil deGrasse Tysons, although they might be fantastic evolutionary biologists, which none of us, none of us say is not right, you know, uh, although they're great evolutionary biologists and great um, astrophysicists, they are. They haven't spent years researching the phenomena that we're discussing. So, although they can very reasonably denounce the experiences, that's not because the experiences aren't genuine. It's because they don't have the context as to why those beliefs exist. You know, understandably so. It's just a shame that um, many people are very much swayed by those uninformed opinions. Yeah, yeah. it is a shame that people with uh, who really have access to microphones sometimes uh, speak into them with uh, not complete mm. Mm. knowledge of what of what they of which they mm. speak. Yeah. But of course, you know, sorry, Steve, just to add on to that briefly, fly in my face. Um, just to add on to that briefly, you know, there there are very informed skeptics um, who a lot of these people do refer to. I know Richard Dawkins refers a lot to Susan uh, Susan Blackmore, who is who is knowledgeable on the field of near death experiences, probably not completely, but reasonably so and the gerald verleys who are familiar with the with the research and so there are very well informed people who have op opposing opinions as to why we're not 100 percent sure um but that that's the sort of person you should go to get educated opinions on the subjects and they, they are out there it's not just a one-sided area and you, you need to have both opinions to really form your own mm -hmm. yeah steve but, uh, sorry, you look like Stephen. you wanted to say something I wanted to say just to Darren's point and your point also, you were talking about how we have the debunkers out there and they're saying, well, 
if it can't be measured and repeated in a lab, but you know, it's not really science. And I was having this conversation, you mentioned Eben Alexander a little while ago, Darren. I had a conversation with Eben Alexander about this very topic. And I said, it seems like we need a new way of measuring because these ex metaphysical experiences that people are reporting, they seem very real to them. So maybe there's a, so maybe the way science approaches these phenomena has to shift in mm. order for it to be counted as science. Indeed. Yeah. It's like trying to measure resistance in a wire with a Newton meter. It's not the right, we don't have the right equipment to do it. Right. Doesn't, doesn't mean it's not measurable and replicable. It just means that the current methods we have, which are designed for physical science, aren't, aren't, um, right appropriate effectively they're just not functionally right. appropriate to, to do so um but again you know and i suppose moving slightly on a bit of a tangent but just to illustrate that, that experience i mean there are apparently extraterrestrials who come through to mediums and like in the skull experiments those who are scientists whatever that means on their side and other races that if these ufos and everything else are, are accurate obviously have some sort of technology that is correct and and functional in our universe but is so far beyond our current understanding and our current ability yeah. that it seems like magic and even though you know if, if you were to present an iphone to someone in the middle ages it would be magic but it's not it's science it's just that it's a science that we haven't discovered yet and i think spiritual matters and communications with extraterrestrials or whatever they are yes is perfectly congruent with our with our reality it's not anything opposed to it it's just something that we haven't yet understood yes you know i think all the time about are you a are you a fan of jane roberts darren have you read any of her books i'm not familiar J jan I, has I, right jan yeah has? seth uh uh-huh right seth. so jane roberts was a channel during the 60s i believe and she used to have um like living room sessions channeling uh someone named seth and she wrote like several books by Seth channeled through her. And one of the things Seth talked about was how, I don't know if he was talking about the future of earth or this was earth before the ice age, but he referred to a, a time that was very futuristic in milieu. And the way things were powered was not nuclear power or fossil fuel power, it was sound. Everything was powered through sound energy. And I thought I was so, and it seems so clean, right? <laughs> Very mm. clean energy and sound energy. We we have the capability of powering things with sound. We I guess we just haven't done it yet, or mm. haven't figured out how to make money how from it or something. It. Yeah. But yes, to your point, there's a whole world that could open up to us uh, if we if we said, okay, this is something that we should really investigate more thoroughly with our brightest minds that we have mm. and uh, i mean yeah. oh go ahead Jerry. Sorry, I, I was just gonna say you know and you know if we think that science is only a few centuries old and we've discovered so much it, it absolutely you know boggles the mind and just how little we we objectively know about the universe it boggles the mind to think how much is out there and what technology is out there you know the utilization of of super of superposition and the utilization of um quantum entanglement technologies th uh, things like that or even concepts that we haven't even discovered begun to discover yet that is, is out there and the capabilities that that sort of technology would have really does boggle the mind as to what the world will be like thousands of years from now if we're still here and haven't blown up the planet yeah so uh you, i'm sure you you know darren i don't know if you know steve that uh, the billionaire Robert Bigelow uh, a couple of years ago did a um, held a an essay competition about the best evidence for the survival of consciousness after death, and uh, that uh, Jeffrey Mishlove won first place. And anybody who's interested in this subject, I highly recommend that you go and watch uh, his uh, video because he includes clips of people that he's interviewed over the years for his thinking aloud series and it's uh very compelling he did a really thorough job now robert bigelow 
concluded from this. I, I, I think he's ahead of the rest of the world. I don't think the rest of the world concluded from this, but Robert Bigelow concluded that the survival of consciousness after death is a is an established fact. And his next question is how humans might communicate with non-physical entities, um, especially like higher wisdom entities um, to find out um, how humanity might be of service to them and how they see that they might be able to uh, be of service to humanity. So um, so he's he's kind of moving along in the direction that y'all were talking about, you know, trying to mm -hmm. trying to um, use that in part to um, develop the science of uh, of spirit. So, yeah. yeah. And, and there are projects in development like the soul phone, isn't there? I don't know very much yeah. about that, but do you know yeah. much about the technology of that? Not a lot. No, no. But no. I but I do agree that there's a lot of um, uh, electronic uh, voice phenomenon, unit, like, phenomena, uh, EVP. EVP. Yeah. Mm. Uh huh. And uh, that, yeah, that's another another, um, I guess, medium of communication. Uh, yeah, I've, I've spoken to several who have or maybe a couple who have engaged in that Sonia Rinaldi and uh, Annabelle Card Cardoso, who specialize in, in direct radio voice phenomena. And she was, um, Annabella, I think, and Sonia, in fact, was showing me clips of perfectly audible. And I don't mean like, you know, the fuzzy, you could have said this, they could have said that, we don't know, but we were assuming it's this. It was clear what they were saying. And they were saying it in Spanish, they were saying it in English. And there was no denying that the only way she could have done that is by faking somebody else saying it because it was that clear. Right. You know, and whereas you see on YouTube, a lot of these popular videos of haunted houses and, and um, ghostly encounters are always very fuzzy, very much forced and yeah. very spooky. But the, the actual phenomena that comes through can be incredibly clear. Yes. You know, and uh, especially by the yeah. way darren i did sp i did interview um gary schwartz about the soul phone mm -hmm. he i didn't really understand the technology behind it but i could share with you you and your audience that he predicts that there will be a working soul phone now i've heard this before so i can't say guarantee it but he did say within two years there should be like a prototype that people can actually be trying and I, I, if I give you a very rudimentary explanation for how it works, just like on some of these entertainment shows about ghost hunting, the way that people are, the ghost hunters are communicating with spirit is by um, having a, a light, like a flashlight where the, the top is screwed off. So it's a barely connection to make the flashlight works. And that way the spirit can easily kind of flicker the flashlight. Well, if you could establish a pattern using mediums and using like something like a flashlight, if you could establish patterns as to the flickering, you could create an alphabet. It's almost like Morris, Morris code. So getting the spirits to <laughs> cooperate in these experiments using Morse code, you can, he's trying, he's, he's attempting to create a keyboard basically. So yeah. people can text the spirit world. Now that's hard for me to get my brain around. That's where I, 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 I tend to be like a little bit, I don't want to say dubious because I'm open to it, but mm. it's hard for me to figure, figure out how that's going to work. Yeah. But yeah. he's pretty confident and he's got a whole team of pretty high profile mediums and whole pro whole high profile investigators and scientists who are saying, yup, it's, it's going to come, it's going to be here. And it's, yeah. it's going to be here within you know, a few years. It, so it that's, sounds that's almost... It sounds almost like a digital Ouija board kind of arrangement. Mm. And now yeah. I, I am especially skeptical of, of, of Ouija boards and things like that, but it sounds kind of a similar idea where you've got the, um, as you say, the uh, communicating via individual letters. Mm -hmm. That that would be interesting mm -hmm. to see how that develops because that would be a, a game changer if it does actually work and can be verified and you get veridical messages come through, as, as Jan was saying earlier. It'd be interesting. 
It would. And with all this talk about future directions, Steve, have you thought about uh, what your next project might be, or have what have you, what ha, or do are you do you think you'll be doing another documentary, and if so, what topics have you toyed with? Uh, I like the question because it makes me feel like a real filmmaker, <laughs> <laughs> and. I, I'm almost ashamed to say I'm not a real filmmaker. I feel like this was my movie. Now, wow. I, I do like the idea. I'm more of a writer, Jan. I, I like the idea of making another movie. It, it sounds romantic, but I feel like I put so much into this film, so much of my life. Uh, I spent my I spent all this time <laughs> while my child was growing up I was focusing in this movie. I feel like I now have to be <laughs> focused on my family more. And I feel like getting the word out that the, the, about what's in the film is probably more important than the film itself. Mm -hmm. So that's where all my energy is going, is just distributing this film, doing these Q&As with audiences. I'm going to be doing a TED Talk in October. Yeah. And um, I'm going to be talking about the elements in the film and i'm really i really want to bring a lot of eyeballs to it and just the content jan's been doing unbelievably just marvelous work and i think that i, I can't be selfish i can't just have it for me in my films it has to be shared and i'm i'm really just trying to get my mic my, my megaphone is as large as possible from mm. this point forward i don't know if it's going to be a whole 10 years going to be spending on on this kind of thing but yeah. I don't have any projects lined up right now. No. Okay. And, uh, okay. Thank you for asking. Yeah. And uh, two follow-up comments, and then I know you want to say something, Darren. Um, speaking of work, uh, that anyone listening to this program who is an educator who might want to use Life with Ghosts in their class, there's a great companion guide that uh, for educators or people who want to have a like a discussion group or something like that. Um, it's it's really a a, a nice um, a true a companion to the movie, and um, and that uh, if ever you do feel moved to do another movie, my uh, request would be to do something on veridical after death mm. communication. Yeah. yeah, I think that's the uh, most important validating aspect of, of all of, all of this. There are a lot of compelling stories out there that would be you know wonderful to to document yes. jen what has to happen in our world for there to be enough veridical evidence where it becomes established science what what's going to make that change well i i do think that i think that the information is there i think it needs to be brought together and then presented in a way that reaches a wider audience like your movie does but a documentary about um, veridical after death communication, I think, is uh, that that again has that popular appeal, mm. um, has the potential to be very influential in um, in um, shifting the worldview toward um, idealism, the idea that consciousness is. I'm using, I don't know if that's the actually correct term, but the idea that consciousness is primary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But mm -hmm. then I would have to figure out a way to make it more like the Trojan horse. So it's not about after death communication, it's about somebody who doesn't believe in after death communication, mm -hmm. who is desperate to communicate and then finds a way. Yeah. How's that sound? <laughs> It sounds good. I mean, I, I'm not sure how to make that happen, but I'll it, think it about would take it. You, it would certainly take you a while, I think. But yeah. yeah, there are certainly more than enough cases out there to really make something important on it. Um, and I was, I was just going to mention as well, the um, alongside this interview, you know, anybody that's watching this can access a private screening of, of Life with Ghosts through a link that I'll put in the description um, for. I don't know if it's, is it timed? Is there a specific period on it or is it open for... Good. Well, I do have like scheduled screenings coming up, but I also have these the, the private screenings that I arrange for a time with the co-host. Mm -hmm. So I think people should just like reach out to me and contact me if they want to use it for their either their 
association or if they want to do it for educational purposes or their community sure. or for themselves. I mean, they could just reach out to me. Sure, because I know Jen did send a link for the for a private Seek and I screening. So I'm guessing that's on a specific day. So um, we'll we'll arrange that and then the information will be available on on my socials and wherever else, probably in the description as well. Uh, so we'll let you know about that. But certainly worth worth seeing if you can because it's a very just a very important message very important documentary and very very much a, a good way of displaying the evidence that is up to date and you know very very reasonable from a scientific and philosophical perspective whether you believe it or not thank you darren it's always good this is always a good opportunity for me to boast a little bit do you mind if i boast on your sure, program you can say exactly whatever you like <laughs> It, it has won 11 awards in the film festival circuit, including best documentary and best feature film. So if people are, are interested in the message and they also want to see a good movie, it is a good movie. So it's entertaining. It is. As, in addition to being, in, in addition to it being informative. Mm. It strikes that perfect balance, doesn't it? To keep the, re the reader, that's my writing, uh, my writing vocabulary, it, but um, it, engage, it you know keeps the watcher interested, but also provides all that very important information that is real, you know, very real. Yeah, very well crafted. And what is the? Uh, is it still your goal, Steve, to get it on um, PBS? PBS? It'll be on PBS sometime in 2024, but I do not have underwriters yet. I have to admit that I haven't like gone out knocking on doors for that, but I do need underwriters is just a fancy a PBS word for sponsors. Uh, I have to get those before I can actually get it on PBS, but PBS does want it. They want to air it in 2024. I just, I just have to make that happen. Good. Right. Good. And I have to raise, sorry, I have to raise the funding to make that happen. I have to, I have to raise the funding to make a version of the movie for PBS, which is one of the reasons why I'm having these private screenings is to generate mm. enough revenue from ticket sales so i can make an hour-long version right now it's 90 minutes i have to make an hour-long version that's very pbs friendly and they have like this mm. whole you know rules book yeah. i have to follow oh, so that's gosh. a whole month there's a whole month in the editing room yeah oh yeah. at least i mean i i don't know what you can cut out it's no. it's it, there's it's a it's a lean movie as it is yeah. Um, so I just half, half an hour yeah. to cut out half an I, hour. I that's an eternity. Of, unfortunately, I think it's going to be my mother. I think she's the one. She's the character. Unfortunately, I hate to say this, but my mother is the only dispensable character. Hmm. So if I lose my mother, I hate saying that. Hmm. But if I lose my mother, the movie will be about an hour. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. You know, I, I want to say one other thing. We, when we were talking about the psychiatrist before, that was Irene who saw the psychiatrist, right? That was Ethel. Ethel, Ethel. Um, that uh, I was so impressed with her ego strength that mm -hmm. in the face of this psychiatrist who's like kind of imp implying very definitely that she is, you know, deluded, hallucinating. And suffering psychosis, whatever, yeah suffering some kind of mental disorder she's just like you know bless your heart you can think mm. whatever you want i know what's real and and, and, and that also and, gives a very important message that her experiences are so ingrained as knowledge yes that she she doesn't mind being you know told yeah. it's nonsense because you know i i know that this is true as much as i know that if i throw a ball in the air it's going to come back down yeah you know and as it gets caught in a yeah. tree and, you know, and another thing I want to be sure to say is that uh, I think some people are concerned that someone who does automatic writing, let's say every day, that they're like preoccupied, it's somehow interfering with them moving on in life. But actually, I think it's just the opposite. I think it provides a kind of um, psycho-spiritual nourishment, like take a vitamin every day mm -hmm. that, the you know, um, Ethel goes on, she's living a very full life. She goes on walks, she plays cards, she plays the piano, you know, she's, she's just, she's got a really full life. And, um, and, uh, and I think that the automatic writing actually enhances that or, or uh, provides almost a foundation for her to move on and enjoy life without her husband. So yeah yeah and i i wonder Stephen, what kind of response would you give 
for the inevitable um, comment, and I've had it as well, Jan, with the John Wigglesworth case, that fine, these are interesting, but the cases you provide are anecdotal and of little scientific value. Mm -hmm. Well, some phenomena um, can't be predicted and controlled. And the best that we can do is uh, collect evidence uh, and do so openly. So we're looking for um, any cases in which something was revealed that might be true or might be false when we get back to the, you know, the real world. The, the material world, not, you know, that, that world is just as real as this one, the material world. And, uh, and that if we find that uh, there are extremely few cases where there's any kind of error, but mounds of cases in which information that otherwise could not be known fr from a material perspective turns out to be accurate, the collection of those cases and uh, and I call them cases because they're uh, they're uh, investigated um, constitutes scientific evidence. But it's not uh, there. Some phenomena just can't be uh, relegated to a, a randomized controlled study because we we can't make after death communication happen. So, so what would you think to uh, what Jan just mentioned uh, regarding the anecdotes versus the cases and, and your film? Because I'm Should sure. Again, probably... So what, what do you think about what Jan just said about anecdotal evidence versus cases regards to your film? Because I'm sure uh, you'll get some comments on this is good, but they're only anecdotes at the end of the day. I like quoting one of the experts from the film. Um, Jan, by the way, is an expert from the film, but I'm thinking right now of David Hufford. Uh, David Hufford, and this didn't actually make it into the film, but it was in his interview, he talked about how people who complain that something's only an anecdote don't realize that state-of-the-art science is anecdotes plus quantitative analysis. It, it's both, which is pretty much what evolution is. You know, you need to have, in certain cases, you need both. And so if you, you know, take all the cases, if you take hundreds of thousands of cases of people having, you know, whether it's near-death experiences or, or contact with the unseen, and you put them on a table and you line them up and you separate them out into, uh, you know, this th these people had this experience while they were sleeping. This person had their experience while they were like, you know, driving. You could have, you can develop a theoretical conclusion from just dividing up the different anecdotes. And and that's science too. So it just is a matter of people just understanding that anything can be analyzed and measured if you have the right measuring stick. <laughs> mm, mm. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. So um when when will the film be available for the general public? Was it will it be once PBS publish it in 2024 or so? It, yes, exactly. That that'll be the first time it goes, I guess, public. But you know, right now it is available through through my website, and we are doing some Facebook advertising for it. So there are people who are going to just be able to stumble upon it and and be able to see a screening just from finding an ad on Facebook. We're just kind of experimenting with that right now. Um, but for your audience, you know, if they want to attend a private screening. Uh, most likely yours, which will be on August 18th, mm -hmm. I believe, is when the first opening day is. They should just register. They should just register um, on the link that you have associated with this interview. One cut is only 10 minutes, but it's a very dense cut. It has all the information about the therapy that you really need if you, to follow up if you're interested. And that's free. So there's a free version. The Q&A that we'll give is going to be free also. If you want to see the full feature, a full 90-minute feature, that requires a, a small donation. Mm -hmm. And the, right now, the minimum donation is $15. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's very much, I think, from seeing it, I think it's very much worth that for the information it provides. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and certainly, you. as you say, it also supports you for getting it out. And I think it is a very important right. message to get out. Right. The ticket sales will go towards the PBS broadcasts. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So where, where can everybody find any other projects or work that you've done or find out it's just about you yourself on your website? Yeah. I mean, the website, if you put my name in Google, there'll be a lot of interviews that I've done like this. Uh, but yeah, the easiest way is to go to life with ghosts, um, dot com, and uh, you'll be able to find resources and interviews and things like that. Perfect. Okay, so anything else either of you want, want to add, talk about? This has been fun. It always is. Whenever Steve <laughs> and I get together with um, interviewers, I, I just have a really good time. So thank you, Darren. Thank you, Jan. Thanks. It's always great seeing you. Yeah, you too. And thank you very much, Darren, for this.